my client who will, will be cleaning up all this mindset stuff around fears of competency and fears around the boss. And like, they'll come and be like, I got promoted today. And I'm like, what? And it blows my mind every time. I laugh about it and think like, what am I, am I doing magic? Like, is this some kind of magic stuff, this mindset crap? Like, it's so weird to watch it happen in action. Cause even though I'm a mindset coach, I still can't believe the things that happen to people when they learn how to go into their mind and deal with the things that are keeping them stuck. It's just, it's kind of crazy. Welcome to The Art of Speaking Up, a podcast that helps professional women access the limitless potential that lies within them. I'm your host, Jessica Guzik, and my mission is to help you find that spark inside you that has the power to transform your career in ways you may not have thought possible. I'm so excited that you're here, and now on to the show. Welcome to the show. We are back and I am really, really excited because today I am talking to a guest who has been one of my favorite guests on the show and also from the feedback that I've received, one of your favorite guests. And I'm really, really excited because today I'm chatting with Erin Foley and we're talking about mindset and we're talking about some big topics that I know have been huge areas of struggle for me and may potentially also be things that you are working through and I also think are things that don't get talked about enough. I think the things that I get to get deep into when I talk with Erin are topics that we all experience, I think, very, very much and often very intensely, but that I rarely see being talked about openly in professional development spaces for women. And that is why I'm so excited to be able to talk with her and to bring the conversation to you. And we cover quite a lot in today's conversation, but one of the big things we hit on is something that I do a lot of, which is worrying. And in this conversation, she really breaks down worry and we go deep into that topic and she illuminates how it impacts how we show up and how our worry and our experience of worry impacts our results and behaviors in ways that we might not even be aware of. And we talk about how we even relate to our own worry because I know for me, sometimes I feel like I have to worry and I hold on to it. And even though I, on some level, want to let go of it, I find that really, really challenging. And we talk about that too. And she shares so much that I found so helpful and almost feels like a relief to hear. I think when I hear from Erin, I know I personally feel more okay in any struggle that I'm dealing with, and I hope that's what you take away from this conversation as well. She doesn't require much more introduction than that, so with that, I'm going to get straight into it, and I hope you enjoy. All right. I'm so excited to be here. As you know, I'm a fan of the show. I'm a fan of you. And I'm so excited to be back. So I am Erin Foley. I'm a professional development coach. And what that means is that I work mostly with women, although I do have some male clients, and I help them to show up at work in their full potential. And really, I like to say now and beyond, because a lot of us are very skewed on what our full potential actually is. So That looks like sometimes people are coming to me because they're in a new job and they're really panicking and they're in a confidence crisis and they're having a lot of insecurities. Some people are trying to level up. Some of my clients are dealing with like a really difficult boss or coworker and it's co-opting their whole experience at work. So my job is to really get people's mindsets clean and confident and clear and get them showing up to work in a way that helps them be fulfilled, reach their goals, really like go beyond their potential. And we're going to be talking about some of the challenges that your clients encounter. And the first one is a big one. It is fear and worry. So I would love to hear about that, just kind of what you've observed through your work with clients and what you want people who are experiencing that to know. Yeah. So I love this question. This comes up a lot for people, of course. And one of the things I notice when people come to me about their fears and their worries is that people have an assumption that something's wrong with them because they're feeling it. So one of the best things I've learned, and I've learned this through research on this, but also because I get to be behind the scenes with people and like I get to see people's actual thoughts and feelings versus the mask that we all kind of put on in the world. 
I get this beautiful insight into how the human brain works when we really get honest with what we're thinking and feeling. And the first thing I want people to know that I think is so important is that negativity bias is your brain's default mode. So when unattended, (laughs) when sort of just left to its own fruition, the brain tends to move into a negative state which means it's going to be fearful. It's going to latch onto worries. It's going to get in thought loops that don't necessarily feel great. And particularly when you are moving into anything that's unfamiliar to you and your brain, anything, a meeting, a conversation, a presentation, a job, it's going to immediately move into that space of fear. So I think it's so important because I didn't realize that for a good portion of my life. So I kind of thought like, yes, I'm probably someone whose brain is prone to a little bit more anxiety. Some of us have a little more anxiety, maybe a little more fear, maybe more paranoia. Like we all have kind of different flavors, but in general, the brain does not like uncertainty. It doesn't like things that are unfamiliar. And so knowing that it's going to have a bit of a meltdown is really powerful in not giving the meltdown so much power. So I just wrote an article on this and I used an example of if I told you, like, let's say you got a new job and I said to you, hey, for the next six to nine months, every single day, there's going to be a kid who jumps out from around the corner, who's like covered in a sheet, who looks like a ghost and he's going to yell boo. And you were like, what? And I'm like, every day he's going to jump out. Like he's going to just come around the corner and you can expect he's he's coming out and he's going to yell boo. Like the first two or three times you're going to be like what the hell, like this kid's yelling boo, you might get startled. But I've told you ahead of time, he's going to jump out. And you don't need to trust him. He's not scary. He's not real. Nothing's gone wrong. I think knowing that means that by the third, fourth, fifth time he jumps out, you're like, oh, hey, what's up? There's the kid and the ghost. I know that he's coming. I know not to trust it. I know he's not real. So it's the same thing when it comes to the fear-based or the worry mind, particularly when you know you're moving into something that's going to trigger that. It's going to be around the corner for six to nine months in super unfamiliar situations like a new job and expect it. Know that it's coming out. It's going to sound different than boo. It's going to sound like I'm not competent. I don't know what I'm doing. They shouldn't have hired me. You know, this culture sucks. I can't figure out how to please my boss. It's going to yell different things at you, but If you know it's coming, you will have less of an intense reaction. And my hope is that it helps people understand like you can't trust it as giving you an objective take on what's happening. It's just yelling boo, right? It's not real danger. Your brain thinks it's real danger. It's just because you're in something that's unfamiliar or you're in a loop around a fear of judgment or some, your insecurity is getting tapped into somehow. So that's like, I think one of the most life-changing things I've learned about negativity in the brain is just that it's, it's kind of what our brain does on default mode. So stop thinking you're broken. Also, you can consciously move out of that default mode when you have tools. You can consciously get distance from it. You can sometimes shorten the distance between being stuck in a big fear and having to influence your actions. But you can't control the thoughts that come into your mind when they come in, right? You can't. It's like trying to control whether you feel hot or cold when you walk in a room. You're not going to be able to do that. So you have to know stuff is going to come up. Things are going to be yelled at you. You're going to have fears and you're not broken because you have them. And when those thoughts come in, so they just kind of happen. Our brain produces this wonderful stream of torturous information (laughs) that we torture ourselves with. And I think it makes so much sense learning to see it differently, relate to it differently. Is there an element though of, I can allow the thoughts to snowball because I notice that, yeah, it'll come up, but then if I go in it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's not fun. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I call it indulging, indulging that negativity bias. So 100%, the more you indulge it, the more intense it will become. And there's actually research on like, when you're feeling something negative, the brain will look for more and more negative things to connect it to. It will start to grab lots and lots of other things to pull in. It's like, maybe you're fearing that your boss thinks that you're an idiot. And then the next thing you know, you're like, 
you have this big fear about your future and your relationship. And you're like, I've done everything wrong. And like, you find yourself in this deep, dark hole. And you're like, how did I get here? And that's it. You've indulged it. So I kind of like to think about like, for me, I'm pretty familiar with a lot of my common ones, right? So for example, before we started the podcast, this happens to me every time I'm doing something like a podcast, teaching something, doing a speaking engagement. About three to four minutes before, my brain tells me, you don't know anything. You forgot everything you know. Nothing, nothing's going to make sense. <laughs> like Some weird, it always gives me some version of that message, right? I literally know it's coming and I'm like, high five, there it is. And I know not to indulge it. I'm like, it, it feels kind of real when it first pops up. It's just that it's popped up enough for me to be like, I know that's not true. And like, I'm not going to spend any time talking to that. That's really helpful. And I think with the snowballing, I don't know, for me, it can get to a place where like the fully snowballed thought, like when I do indulge, is so wacky. It's so nuts. But when it's in my head, it doesn't feel nuts. It feels like this horrible doomsday thing that's coming. Yeah. And there's here's the trick. Here's where the line is kind of fine. You don't want to indulge. You want to know the ones that are going to come up. You want to know you're in something familiar and it's going to pop up. But when you see patterns that are consistently getting in the way for you. When you see it's a fear that like, when you try not to indulge it, it's just still there. It's affecting your actions. It's affecting your behavior. That's when you know you have a fear that's so strong, it needs conscious time and attention to be able to loosen it, which is something I'll talk about as we move through the interview. But the purpose of like what I do for a living is to get rid of the big things that keep coming up that are really tripping people up because we can get rid of fears. We can release certain fears, right? We can get distance from them. There are some breakthroughs that I have in my life where that fear doesn't creep back in. And knowing the difference between it's, it's just my brain doing its thing. I'm not going to indulge it. And I can, I can sort of move around the ghost and just go about my day, or I can't seem to get around the ghost. It just won't go away. It keeps snowballing. The same one keeps coming up for me. That's when you know there's something that's deeper that you're believing that you're having a hard time getting distance from. That's really helpful. And I also think it's so important and so encouraging for people to hear you say that something that felt like a big, hairy fear, like something that was really difficult, you were able to transmute it into something else. Because I think it's it's very tough to deal with a challenge and also at the same time to wonder if you'll be dealing with it forever. Right. You don't. When you're doing mindset work, it isn't that you master mindset and you don't have mindset issues anymore. You have different ones as you progress. So like the mindset issues that I had early on in my business, the fear around putting myself out there, the fear, you know, that the whole business was going to fail, the fear, I moved through those, like I worked through those. And, and now when I level up in my business, new ones show up, a different version, a slightly different face, like, but I have a way of moving into those and moving through those faster, but it doesn't mean they don't happen to me. If I'm going to keep progressing in my life, I'm going to have mindset issues that continue to arise. It is the very nature of asking my brain to move beyond what it knows. Yeah. I think there are some people who get it less though. Like some people are just game for uncertainty and new situations more than others, at least from my observation. Not not everyone's like me. (laughs) Yes, for sure. There are people who are more comfortable with risk-taking. Some of those people are sort of born more risk-taking than others. A lot of people have learned to fail well. A lot of people have failed enough that they've gotten comfortable with it. So you're right. Those things can look different. And some people have less mindset stuff that comes up, but it might look like something something different than the risk-taking fear, right? When they really level up, all of a sudden they have an anxiety about being able to manage their team or a fear about, it just sort of can take on a different... I haven't met anyone that is super successful yet in my career, who doesn't have something that has, from a mindset perspective, caused them some angst that they've had to work through. And I think it's important for people to know that because what we see is not often what's happening inside someone's head. Oh, it's true. A storm can rage in there and it can be completely invisible. Completely invisible (laughs) and really skew us that like everyone else somehow like has their shit together. And we're like, I don't understand. Like I'm in here in in the panic in this new space or in this meeting and everyone seems just cool as a cucumber. And 
Some of them might be, but some of them are having a complete storm in their head. Yeah, it's true. I don't know if you've ever put on a VR headset, but as soon as I put one on, I was like, oh, that was kind of like the positive version of what it's like to be really, really worried. (laughs) Mm, I haven't. I should try that. (laughs) Well, because you're actually tricking your brain. I don't know if it activates the same parts of your brain as worry or if it does it in like a parallel sort of way. But when you see someone else with a headset on, you're like looking at them and you're like, that person's a weirdo, but they're having this whole other, they're in another planet. Experience. Yeah. True. And it reminds me of that. Do you ever encounter with clients them having trouble managing through the worry because of a kind of weird belief that if like kind of that they need to worry to stay in control and kind of a fear of like letting go and a fear of like not gripping so tightly. Yes. So a lot of people, there's two, two ways that I see this manifest itself. One is the belief that being hard on myself will produce the results that I want. This is a strong one for people. It's sort of that it's a, it's a different version of worry, right? Like I'm not doing enough and I'm not productive enough. I'm not advanced enough. I'm not, it's that just like really hard on yourself voice. And I a hundred percent believed that that was the voice I needed to make progress. And I have to point that out with clients. And then we have to sort of backtrack into a specific situation usually to show you and your brain that the thought tends to lead to behaviors that don't actually help you progress at your highest potential. And that takes some time for the brain to believe because it, it'll be like, no, 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 uh-uh, not true. It's like, not true. I know if I'm hard on myself, it's like, it's going to serve me. It tends to create avoidance where people don't move towards what they want, procrastination because the fear's so big of not doing it right. And it tends to, for those people who can push through it, it tends to create like frantic action or action where you're squeezing so tight that you're just not showing up in a way that is fully yourself, your own confidence, your own potential. So yes, people absolutely think that I need the worry. My brain does it too. Like if I'm anxious about this thing, it's going to control the outcome somehow. And the only way to show it that that's not true is literally to show it that it's not true. I mean, I love the question because the question itself poses the curiosity where you're like, wait, is my worry actually helping this bad thing not happen? And how is it helping the bad thing not happen? Like when you start to dig and try to find the evidence, the evidence is very loose that that worry is actually helping you produce the result that you want. And the evidence that the la- that taking away the worry, and it doesn't mean you take it away and all of a sudden you're like, I want you to become like so careless and so unaware of what's happening that you just, you know, jump off of a building. Like the state that we often are trying to get you to is like focused or determined or confident or so there's still a level of control that we're bringing to you. It's just it's not in a space when you're coming from a space of scarcity or a space of lack, it consistently produces results you don't want in how you feel and in the progress you make. It makes so much sense, I think, in those first instances where you're first working through this and learning to relate to it differently and learning to let go in a way. There are these leaps that you have to take where you kind of have to trust in doing something different because even though the behavior that it's creating isn't what you want, it's very familiar. And I think anytime you try to change there, it seems like for me, there's always this fear of like, well, what if this is wrong? What if I'm wrong? What if it's all wrong and I'm moving in the wrong direction and this doesn't work and I'm going to regret it? And it can be difficult for me to cross that bridge sometimes. It is difficult to cross the bridge. The more specific you can get with situations, the more helpful it is. So I'll often ask my clients, like, why are you holding on to this? What do you think you're gaining from it? Right. And you can ask yourself that question. If you have a fear or you have a belief or you have something, you know, I'm, I'm not doing a good enough job. I'm not capable enough. How are you benefiting from believing that? And be really honest with yourself. Is it I'm not working to my potential. So if I can come up with a thought that sort of makes me feel okay about that, or there's a lot of different like tricks that our brain kind of does, but getting really familiar with like 
the curiosity around it from a neutral place. We're not there to judge it. We're just there to be curious about it. Like, why do I think that this is serving me somehow? And then get specific in the situation. So if the belief is like, I'm not capable in some way, and you're like hell bent on holding on to that, go back to a situation where you last felt that. Look at the actual situation, the conversation you were having with your coworker or the feedback you were taking from your boss. And then look at how you reacted when you were in the space of believing that. And then you have to really try to imagine how you would have reacted if you believed something different. And oftentimes when I'm working clients through this and I'm like, let's say you believed I am capable. Let's say that was a belief you really believed and you're having this conversation with your boss and your boss is giving you feedback and saying, you know, I'm not happy with your sales number and you actually believed you were capable. How would you react in that situation? And people will often be like, well, I would just take it as information. I would decide what can I do differently? And so when you actually work with a real situation, you'll be able to often show your brain the benefit of letting it go. Yeah. It's just hard. Like even hearing you say that, I could feel my insides grasping. <laughs> just, just hearing that second hand. And like, I'm not even a salesperson. I was like, <laughs> what part made it grasp? I'm curious. Just the feedback part. As soon as I heard you say you missed your numbers, mm. I don't know, something happened inside me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. It, which is a very natural reaction to criticism. So I want to be really clear with people that we are not built to enjoy criticism. It is something that we have to get good at taking and the muscle we have to build for sure. It's not ever going to feel like at first attempt where we're like, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Please tell me more. It's a fight or flight reaction that your body has immediately where it's like you're in danger and the information coming at you is life or death. So your reaction is very normal, but it's not inevitable. And also when the reaction happens, if you start to notice that it is happening, then you can decide, you know, then what you want to think about that reaction and how you want to respond to the fact that you're having that reaction. But I think it's still really difficult. And I, I know, you know, professionally asking for feedback is so important. And it's one of the fastest ways to get better at your job and to really grow and progress. And I know for me, one of the things that I've had to work through is the fear of getting negative feedback and not wanting to ask for anything because it, it, it can feel so, so scary to open up that door and say like, all right, I'm opening my door for you to put stuff in and you're going to put in some scary stuff and I'm scared. Mm -hmm. uh, totally. I just listened to a podcast on work life where he went into a company that sort of builds its whole company on the basis of feedback. And so the idea is everyone gets criticism constantly. And of course, not everyone makes it through the sort of initial, you know, first several months when they get hired. I think they said like a third of their people end up quitting. But for the people that do, the norm is totally open, honest, upfront feedback all the time from everybody. And what was so fascinating is they had an employee in the company talking about how his brain was able to learn to associate the feedback with something good. Because in time, because it, it's happening so much, it's helping him progress. He sees that the learning and the growth and the goals and all the things that he's gaining from it. So the brain finally learned to make an association that the feedback is good. When you tell me something I need to do better that I didn't do, my brain goes like, oh, good, now I'm going to improve. And so it's totally possible to do it, but you absolutely have to like desensitize yourself almost to the, the reaction that this is a danger and you have to practice associating it with your growth. And we can choose not to want to be uncomfortable. Like that's fine too. There are times where like my coach is pushing me to grow in a certain direction. I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to do it. I don't, it. I don't care enough about this to do this. Yes, I can see how that would progress X, Y, or Z. But like for now, I'm, I'm going to stay comfortable. And that's fine too. Yeah, I actually think that's really important. And I've had a lot of instances where like I'll have an allergic reaction to personal development stuff. It's just like push and go and go because I think that is it also ignoring something in us that's very, very human and can help us regulate kind of our rhythm of like when we're growing versus when we're resting. And I think we're meant to be cyclical and I think we're meant to listen to ourselves very honestly. And I think that that's 
is really real too. And that was also a big reason why I wanted to start this show in the first place, because I think so much of the challenges that women encounter professionally are met with this advice of like, well, you need to do this and then you need to do this and you need to do this and like, don't sound like a weirdo and don't sound this way because it's going to ruin your career. And of course, we want to show up with the best that we have. And of course, the professional world can be a very challenging, high pressure place. But I also think if we only have that stuff, and we never have a space for like, you know what, I think it's just okay for you to cry today. And don't worry about anything else. Just like, let it go through. How are we ever going to get to a point where the strength that we've built is actually sustainable and actually feels good? Yeah. Progress for the sake of progress and nothing else, like advancing just for the sake of advancement isn't helpful. It's like the goal for me is always, where are you suffering and how can we ease that? What steps or actions do you want to be taking and how can we support you in doing that? It's not defining for you what you should want, right? You get to decide what you want and you get to feel internally what you want. And that's super important. It's super important to be connected to your values, what feels good to you, what's motivating to you, what you want in your life, right? I can't tell you the amount of times I've said no to opportunities that would have advanced me to the next level that I had zero desire to do, did not align with the lifestyle I wanted or the life that I wanted. So a hundred percent that just pushing this advancement for the sake of advancement can get people really confused and really lost in terms of if this is even me and this is even what I want and why am I even doing this and pushing through for the sake of pushing through. Yeah, for sure. And even if you know that you do want to change and even if you are kind of wanting to evolve, become stronger in your professional life, it's not just... I don't know, there's a lot of blind prescription of like do X, Y, Z without any investigation around, well, like, why, why are you having challenges in the first place? Like, what's going on here? It just kind of feels like writing this blanket prescription for everyone. And it's like, well, well wait a minute. Like, if someone's having troubles sharing their voice in the workplace or speaking up, I don't think the solution is just tell them do it more. There's something more happening there. Sorry, I get really fired up about this. What you're talking about is is strategy without diving into the mindset. Mm -hmm. And I see that all the time. And I used to think it was like a 50-50 thing in your life. I was like, you knew 50% strategy. And now I've realized it's 80-20. 80% of it is mindset. 20% of it is strategy. There's a million strategies for how you can speak up. There's a million strategies for how you can build a business. There's a million strategies for how you can advance in your career. The strategy itself isn't what gets you there when you can clean up your mindset and be in a space where you feel confident enough to speak up in the way that makes sense for you, when you believe in your capabilities, when you can work through the fears or the anxieties or the things that are sort of keeping you stuck in your job or really co-opting your day, the strategies become easier for you to figure out in terms of what makes the most sense for you, what actions are going to work well for you. Those work themselves out. People tend to start with the strategy and then they can't figure out why they feel so crappy while they're trying to apply it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And also, it's kind of like the power of that ghost that says boo, and the brain generating all of these thoughts that make you feel horrible. That I believe that there's also a reverse to that power. And that, of course, like we want to get to the, a place where we can somewhat neutralize that. But then when you're able to feel inspired, and you're able to harness positive feelings, the strategy can become irrelevant at a certain point because the energy that brings is so powerful. It really is. I've been doing this new practice every day where I self-coach every morning before I start my day. And I do not have a to-do list for the day until after I've self-coached because it cleans up any of the muck. I get myself into the state that I want to be in so that I'm taking the inspired actions that I want to be taking. And it's so fascinating. And sometimes the things that I want to be doing for the day or need to be doing to move through my business are exactly what I thought. And sometimes they're totally different. And it a hundred percent is the belief behind it. The feelings that I'm generating, the mindset that I'm getting in that's sort of cleaning up the muck that changes my actions. And I would have thought like, to be honest with you, four years ago, if you had told me that I would have thought it was a bunch of hogwash. Like it just would have sounded, it just would have sounded like sort of empty self-help advice. Mm -hmm. And 
even sometimes when I'm talking about it now, I'm like, I don't know. It just sounds because it it can just sound like this this positive thinking bumper sticker, and it's it's really so much deeper than that because it's learning how to feel your emotions, it's learning how to understand your mind, it's learning how to move past beliefs that are keeping you stuck. It's much deeper. It requires a lot more emotional intelligence, but it can feel sort of surface level. Had I not done this for the years that I've been doing it, I wouldn't understand how powerful it actually is. Like I'm blown away at my client who will will be cleaning up all this mindset stuff around fears of competency and fears around the boss. And like, they'll come and be like, I got promoted today. And I'm like, what? Like, I can't even believe that it's influenced their actions, their energy so much at work that the, this thing has happened. And there's no strategy that we had that was like specific to how she was going to get this promotion or go for just enough of a shift that it kind of changed everything and how she showed up. And it blows my mind every time because I'll be like, I laugh about it and think like, what am I, am I doing magic? Like, is this some kind of magic stuff, this mindset crap? Like, it's so weird to watch it happen in action because even though I'm a mindset coach, I still can't believe the things that happen to people when they really get comfortable with their emotions and failure and learn how to go into their mind and deal with the things that are keeping them stuck. It's just, it's kind of crazy. (laughs) It's like the mindset is a fertilizer, but it can grow anything. Totally. So the plant can be whatever you want. And I think it may be a helpful example, at least that I've encountered professionally of this is like working on a project and being like, this is so hard. There's no way I'm going to be able to do this. We're not going to make this deadline. And then all of a sudden the tides can turn with the piece of positive feedback or a surge of something good that makes everything feel different. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait, this isn't so hard. We have plenty of time. This is going to be fine. And it's like same exact fact, same exact scenario. I just feel differently. And the world just transformed from like gray and rainy and stormy to sunny <laughs> and the birds are chirping. And I'm like a princess in a movie with like little blue birds following me around. Yes. <laughs> here's what's so important for the listeners to get that I still have to remind myself the difference when you just talked about between scenario one, this is so hard and scenario two, the difference is not the feedback. The difference is what your brain is telling you. Mm -hmm. It's literally because your thoughts changed about what you were working on and you believed them because of the feedback, you believed them quickly, right? So if you hadn't gotten the feedback, and I was coaching you, it would take more work to get your brain to believe the same thoughts. This is actually fun. We're doing great. We're focused, like all of that. But the feedback got you there quickly, but the only difference is what your brain's telling you. And that actually will influence how you're feeling and then your behaviors. And it's, it's just so bonkers. It's fascinating because what if the feedback was an email that got sent to me by accident and it was meant for someone else? Right. And then I felt amazing. And then I realized it wasn't meant for me. You know, like all of that was just because I thought this thing happened and it changed my entire experience. Yeah. 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 I love that. I love that. What if it was just an accident? (laughs) Outcome though is still the same for you, which is great. (laughs) Yeah. I think it's a good way to just show like what we make it mean. Um, And while we're on worry, I think this is a really big one is worrying about what other people think. Mm -hmm. And I want to hear everything that you have to share around that. Okay. So worrying what other people think, fear of judgment. I'm going to say the the first thing I'm going to say about it is the same thing I said about worry in general. It's a natural, normal reaction, right? So I've said this before. I say this all the time. This whole thing of like, you just shouldn't care what people think ever. And like people throw that advice out all the time. It's not how 99% of us are going to function, right? There's a few enlightened people that are floating around the earth who like operate on a different realm than most of us. But you're going to care what other people think to some extent because you're human. You want to be accepted. You want to have love. You want to have food, water, and shelter. So there's always going to be a sense of that, right? Whose opinion we care about to what extent, this is when the things start to get different. And to some extent, when you really think about like being able to evaluate how other people are perceiving you, it's actually a skill. So There's this ability to sort of self-monitor, like I'm in a group and I'm talking and I notice if people are tuned in or they're not tuned in, or I notice like maybe I'm talking about myself too much and I'm not asking questions. So there's one level of this that's a good skill that we want people to have. We've all been in the conversation where like the person's like really unaware, they can't self-monitor. 
they've been like co-opting the conversation and telling all these boisterous stories and like everybody's bored and everybody's like, oh my God, can this person shut up? So they are like not thinking about people's judgments of them at all or people's reactions to them at all. The thing that's tricky is that when insecurities seep in, we're terrible at being able to evaluate what, how people are perceiving us. So yes, people are going to be judging, like we're all judging most of the time about something, right? And it's different. I know if I walk into a room and I start speaking on a topic, all of y'all are going to have a different opinion of me. Like people are going to say different things. One person's going to like me. One person's not going to like me. One person's going to think I'm crazy. One person's going to think I'm smart. And that's because the judgments are filtered through our own perceptions. And I think the most important thing to know about the, the fear of being judged is that your insecurities run the show when it comes to your fear of judgment, always. So like, yes, I might be uncomfortable if I walk in a room and people are like, life coaching is crazy and it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard and why would you ever do that? It's so hokey. When I had that fear and I believed maybe this is hokey, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. I was so attuned to it. I thought I saw it everywhere. I thought every person I met was thinking it. Then that fear went away for me. And I was like, I'm not afraid of that. I love life coaching. This is so powerful. This is changing my life. This is changing other people's lives. I'm cool with it. And I feel secure in it. It doesn't mean that I don't walk in a room and someone might not be thinking that. There might be someone in that room who thinks life coaching is hokey, but I am not tuned into it. I'm not looking for it because I don't have such an insecurity around it. So when you have the insecurity, you literally look for it everywhere. So you're hyper aware if someone believes it and you also think you see it when it's not there. You're like a thirsty person who thinks there's water everywhere you turn. It reminds me of those scenes where like... um in like a TV show where the cops like have a flashlight and they're like looking for like someone hiding, you know, and they're like checking around every corner. Yeah. You literally are looking for it and you think you see it. So like the thing about the fear of judgment is when you're operating from just the sort of normal space of fear of judgment, like if I'm in a room and people are like life coaching stupid, of course I'm not comfortable. I don't love that. I'm not like, Oh, cool. Great. High five. But it's, it's going to be so short lived for me because I don't have that insecurity. I'm going to be like, well, that felt like a sting. I'm going to move over here to this conversation or these aren't my people or whatever. And I'm going to bounce back from it pretty quickly. It's not going to like stick in my head for two weeks. I'm not going to ruminate over 700 different things I want to say back to them. It's just going to be in passing, right? Because it's not my personal insecurity. If I have that insecurity, I'm going to see it with every person in that room. And 80% of the time, I'm going to see it where it's not. And that's what gets us into trouble with the fear of judgment. You can't control people's judgments, period. But you need to know that if you're fearing something really strongly and it's sticking, it's your own self-judgment every time. That is just super fascinating because I think when we think about fear of what other people think, we're kind of deluding ourselves into thinking that it's about them. And oh, we always think it's about them. It's true. Yeah. And even on myself, I will be, it's like, I, I know this stuff, right. And I'll have something that comes up for me and I'll be like, oh, I'm just like worried because I feel like they think I'm blah, blah, blah. And I have to stop and really push the brain to see this is my fear. When you feel like your boss thinks you're incompetent and you have this fear of being incompetent, you're going to see it everywhere. It's your, you feel like you're afraid you might not be competent. You're afraid you might fail. You're afraid people think you're not funny. If it's a fear, if it's a judgment that sticks, and here's the other way you can tell, think of something that you, you feel super secure in, right? So I love the armchair expert podcast and Dak Shepard always talks about how like, If he walked in a room and people were like, you're not tall. (laughs) Like, I don't know who you think you are. You're not tall. There's no part of him that's like, what? Like people are, people are judging me for not being tall. Cause he's like, I believe I'm tall hundred percent. I have an existence of being tall. I feel confident in being tall. So I don't worry about it. I don't look for it. And it doesn't create some big reaction in me. If I think someone thinks it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's interesting because I think 
if someone is trying to move out of this and is aware, is it like a more of a slow, cautious moving out of it in little steps? Or because it feels like something where if you try to, if you're like, I'm going to reverse this and I'm going to stop caring, you might almost push yourself too far into a place of even more discomfort. So how how do you move out of it? So it's not about not caring anymore. It's about really diving into your fear. Mm. That's all it is. It's a really, it's a really compassionate process. So, you know, my fear of being like telling people I was a life coach and thinking I saw it everywhere was I had to like get really honest with myself about where that was coming from. I left this job as a professor, you know, I don't have the accolades. Can I get results for my clients? I was questioning. So I just, it wasn't valid in my mind yet. So I had to get really curious and compassionate with myself about like, okay, you're just feeling this insecurity around life coaching. So what I want to work on is this belief that like, I've made a good move and I'm going to get people results with my coaching. And this is a valid industry and I'm good enough even as a life coach right? Like those were the real root of what was going on. And so the work was in recognizing that and working on that so that I could stop projecting the other thing. And so if somebody had some adverse reaction to life coaching, the other way, you know, you've got that fear is like, if someone had an adverse reaction to life coaching, I decided it was my job to like convert them. Like I would be like, I have to fight them on this. I have to convince them. And it's because I'm convincing my own self-worth in that conversation. I'm like, I got to convince them because I'm scared that it's hokey in some way. So I've got to convince this other person versus when I'm secure in it, I'm like, cool. Like it's not for you. You think it's hokey. Great. Like you can believe that. That's okay. It's not going to shatter me. This is so helpful. Like everything you're saying is really, really helping me. And also I think is just reminding me of how freaking subjective the world is. And yes, like how one person can be like so triggered by something and then someone else isn't, but then that second person is triggered by their own thing. Totally. We're all moving through the world having a reaction to this, like oftentimes the same circumstance and we're all reacting differently. Yeah, it's just like a different thing. And it's like the situation that makes me feel insecure is fine for you. But then there's another situation where it's reversed. It's like, I will say what what we're talking about and, and you describing the world being subjective and my own fears, judgments, self-talk is influencing how I see and perceive everything is undoubtedly the most significant change that's happened in my life. When that really made sense to me and clicked for me and I understood that that is 100% true, it like gave me so much power over any circumstance or situation because I understood that I could shift a reaction if I went internal and really looked at. It made me face fears. It made me get honest with myself about the things that I was thinking about myself and the insecurities that I had. And so... It's just like when you learn a concept in college and you're like, wait, what? Like all of a sudden I remember being like, wait, what? This whole time I've been living my life as if that wasn't true. And it sort of shifts everything. Is it normal for it to take a lot of time for that to happen? Yes. I mean, and it's, I didn't come to that. I work on knowing that and being aware of that. I work on it, right? I self-coach myself. I have coaches that can like coach me. I enroll in professional development work that sort of helps me be more and more insightful. So it's something that like when I get kind of mindset lazy and just sort of like start letting my brain take over and I stop doing anything and I stop observing, it just sort of backtracks into a default. And I have to look around at my life and my circumstances, how I'm feeling about them and be like, what's going on? It feels like maybe I'm not looking at things. I'm not trying to figure out where my subjective experience is like influencing everything that's happening. So it's totally natural that it takes time and it takes effort and it's a muscle. Yeah. I don't know. For me personally, it's just, it's frustrating how it's just like a slew of days where things, it feels like progress is being made. And then I don't know, sometimes one bad day can really just like send you so far back and you're like, oh my gosh, I thought that like, you know, I thought I was getting better. (laughs) I always say like, think about it as a spiral. 
Because life will always keep throwing you new things. Life will always throw you a new challenge. Someone, people die, relationships end, like suffering will continue because we're going to move through life and have all these different experiences. But what tends to happen is that like, as you learn tools and as you become aware of how to be more aware of your own subjective reactions to things, the spiral gets smaller and smaller. The distance between that gets shorter. But the highs and lows, like it's normal. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that like you're not progressing or you're failing at your mindset or any of those things. It's just a normal human reaction. And like when you look at that and come out of that, you'll gain something different from having gone so deep or so low or been there so long. I do feel like it increases, at least for me, my capacity for empathy and to be compassionate towards other people. Yeah. And towards yourself. If you can get compassionate towards yourself, man, that changes the game. That is going to be a lifelong learning process for for (laughs) sure. It is like anytime I think about mindset stuff or go deeper into it, it, that's always at the root. And it's also the thing that I absolutely 100% struggle with more than anything else. And I'm kind of just allowing it to be a slow process because I know that there's no other way. And to recognize that with all of the things we're talking about, you can just recognize that in a particular moment, you can be out of that. So it might just be the moment that I say to you, your fear of you know being a, a, in a hokey career is being projected and you're just afraid that you're in a hokey career. And like, let's take a moment to be kind to yourself about the fact that you're not in a hokey career. You can be in self-compassion for just that moment and let that be enough for that moment, right? Instead of like, because the brain's going to keep going back to that negativity bias and it's going to keep going back to wanting to be hard on you about particular things. But if you can recognize that like you're able to pull the curtain back, take a moment, fall into the self-compassion, like let that be good enough instead of always trying to think like I have to change it so that it's never there. I think it's just the act of it is very fear inducing for me. And so it's just very, very difficult. It feels like a very risky letting go, even though it's not, I know factually it's not, but just at a level beyond that, it feels that way. And that is a very strong force that is very present for me. The act of letting go of the, like being hard on yourself in general is fear inducing. Yeah. Of like opening the door a little crack for that compassion to come in. It, it's very, I, I'm getting better at it. And it is something that I have worked on. And there's like slow little progress, but it is very challenging for me. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to do the, a list of like, all the things that you think you're benefiting from when you're hard on yourself. Really get curious, because I think you have to get curious at like a meta level. Like, I'm like, here's all the things I feel like I'm gaining from being hard on myself. Then list all the things that you feel like you're losing when you're hard on yourself, right? So you can like literally see it from a perspective that's kind of more big picture and all the things that you're afraid will happen if you're nice to yourself. Like get really curious and start challenging some of the beliefs that are driving that behavior. Yeah, I think there's a component for me of like also just learning through experience to just internalize that it's okay to have more self-compassion because I know very logically that it's true, but it's more just like generating enough proof points that this practice is okay and that it's okay. But I don't know. There's something, I don't exactly know what it is. There is, I know exactly what you're saying. Like I need more evidence of doing it. But the key with you is what's going to make you do it is when you can keep challenging the big belief that you shouldn't do it at some level. Mm -hmm. There's something else behind there. My coach antenna, of course, is super up. I don't want to go too far into it. But like, there's something else behind there, I think that's driving the desire to like, almost be rebellious against it. Mm -hmm. But like, I guess for that thing that's behind it, it's like, I don't want to poke it in the wrong way. And then it explodes, you know, it's like, I, I want to just like kind of let it evolve the way it needs to. Like, I guess I don't want to push too hard on it. I'm afraid. I don't know why. Mm, So there's a belief that if I really go into it, it's going to explode or I'm pushing too hard. Yes. Yeah. So I would look at that. Okay. Wow. That right there is influencing how you're approaching it. Yeah. It's so interesting. It's like just 
I don't know, it's just fascinating that all of these thought systems and structures get formed and like, probably none of it's true even. <laughs> I love it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I love that you'd be vulnerable on here so that your, your listeners can like, listen to you being like struggling through it. It's all, it's all, you know, tricky stuff, man. Our thoughts can get all kinds of twisted up in our brain. Yes, it's really, really true. And it's always difficult. But I think if people see that they're not alone, I think it makes them feel a lot better about it. Because I think especially in the professional world, so much of this kind of stuff is hidden behind the curtain. And so then I know like when I was really struggling, I was like, oh, sucks to be the only person that's broken in this entire world of professional working people. (laughs) (laughs) And before we round out part one of this wonderful conversation, can you just talk a little bit about the relationship between mindset challenges and exhaustion? Yeah. I mean, I think there's no question that mindset leads to exhaustion, right? What's fascinating is that we tend to think, and I, it's so funny because I think possibly what we were just touching on with you might be behind this, but like we tend to think that, that if we don't go too far into it or if we avoid it a little bit, it will actually save us energy. At least I used to think that. Like I would be like, I don't want to go into all of this stuff or take the time to like prime my mind. Like I don't have time for that. There are these other things that I need to be doing. But the fascinating thing is that you actually spend more energy in the process of avoidance. Not only does it like take up a ton of energy to avoid the thing or repress the thing or keep trying to sidestep the thing that's like keeps nagging, but it then creates more exhausting behaviors because it's what leads to our avoidance, our perfectionism, over-researching, right? Like all these different ways in which we're going to deal with, like maybe we like just feel like we're not smart enough for our job and we don't want to explore that. We don't want to go into it. We're like, it just is, is, and we try to avoid it. And we try to, we will end up creating behaviors that create more exhaustion. So you're either going to buffer you're going to watch Netflix, you're going to drink, you're going to go shopping, right? We're going to over-research. We're going to try to perfect everything that we're doing. We're going to show up defensive. It's like we're going to take part in behaviors that are far more exhausting. It's like the difference between being decisive and like ruminating over a decision for three weeks. Think about how much energy it takes to ruminate over a decision for three weeks, how much mental energy it takes, how much focus it takes, how much space in your brain it's taking up. So for me, every time I allow myself to go into the deepest fear, allow myself to go, I literally will think to myself sometime before I get on with my coach, I'll be like, what's the thing I don't want to talk about? (laughs) What is the thing I hope she does not ask me about? (laughs) And then I do not have to go into. And I'll be like, this is the thing I have to go into. And I hate it. Cause I'll be like, I don't want to go into it. I don't want to feel this. This is going to take too much. I don't have the energy for this. And inevitably I have such a sense of relief and such a sense of like calmness that I'm able to focus better, be more productive, have more energy to move through the thing that I want to move through. So I'm a great example of someone like I always joke, I could be like sitting on the couch watching the Gilmore girls all day and I would be exhausted. And it was because my brain was on overdrive constantly. It was on repression, avoidance, hypercritical thinking, overthinking all the time. I think that is so helpful and it's so important because even without all that exhaustion from overthinking, working a corporate job can be just on its own pretty demanding in terms of hours and commuting and people have families and other responsibilities. It it adds up a lot, especially in that Monday through Friday chunk. And I think adding on to that then the additional drain of what you're talking about can really compound and make things really, really difficult. And I so wish for anyone listening to be able to get to a point where at least some of the drain that's happening because of the inner stuff can be worked through so that there's more energy and also hopefully more fun and more joy and even more sense of like exciting playfulness problem solving in their job that makes it feel more engaging and they look forward to it more. Yes. I want to give a a really fun example I love of this because I think it's helpful for people. One of the biggest ones that will happen to me and happens to my clients is like, just imagine how you're feeling when you're constantly thinking like, I have so much to do. I have so much to do. I have so much to do. Okay. And like, think about what feeling state that evokes in you. So if you're 
literally playing the script. I have so much to do. I have so much to do. I have so much to do. Most people will say it makes me feel anxious, panicked, rushed. Okay. Then I ask people to think about how they behave when they're anxious, panicked, and rushed. <laughs> and, and it's fascinating. We get different things. Like for me, I tend to want to buffer with something and like just not go into it. Or I tend to like over research or overthink, or I tend to like multitask at like a crazy kind of um, sloppy level, right? Then I tell people, let's assume the circumstances are exactly the same. Your to-do list is exactly the same. The pace at your job is exactly the same, but you don't actually believe, oh my God, I'm so busy. You believe I have a list of things to do that I can get done. I mean, we would try on different thoughts, right? Because it's got to be something that's believable to you, but feels neutral or calming. Or th- there's the same amount of time in every day. I'm just going to move through my day. And as soon as I can get your brain to a space that evokes a feeling of like focus, productive, and calm, you are going to be way less exhausted while you're working through that. Because all of a sudden, like a lot of times the one I'll latch onto for myself is like, one thing at a time, it'll be fine. One thing at a time. And when I calm myself down and I stop that frantic energy of like, oh my God, I have so many things to do. do." It's like, oh, like I can like now save all that energy to focus on the one thing I'm working on. And I am so much more productive and I'm so much more focused and I move through my day and as busy as I might be, at least I didn't utilize a bunch of energy feeling busy (laughs) and try to manage that feeling state on top of managing the things I have to do. Yes. And for anyone listening who is wanting to advance and grow their career and probably manage teams, I think what you're talking about is also a really important modeling and level setting to do as a leader, because I a lot of times team members will take their cues from their leader. And not only that, but if they're feeling overwhelmed, uh, you know, their manager or their leader's kind of state of mind and approach is going to affect them. Yeah. And it really like spreads really quickly and creates a subculture within a team. And it's uh, very difficult to do it for other people if you can't do it for yourself. So I think also to anyone who struggles with these things, I think for me, sometimes a helpful way to get through the struggle is thinking about what you want to model for the people around you, who their quality of life and the quality of the professional experience they're having is going to be enormously affected by what you choose to do. And so in, you know, in giving yourself the space and the patience and the kindness to get out of those situations, you're going to give the same thing to the people around you. And that's really special. And I know for me, that's very motivating because like referencing my challenge with self-love, sometimes it's easier for me as a starting point or an entry point to push myself out of a struggle you know, through the motivation of what it will do for someone else. Helping other people. Yeah. I'm assuming, yeah. yeah. It's it's kind of like a, a sneakster way in for right. me sometimes when I can't get in out of like kindness to myself. Yeah. It is a good sneakster way to get it. And it is very true because we've all been in a space with someone who's operating from a frantic energy and a space where someone's operating from a calm one. And we can easily find that to be contagious, particularly if like we're sort of outward facing where all of our emotions and all of our things are out. And we have a hard time like monitoring that it gets affected by the person that's coming at us greatly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And even if you're not the leader, even if you're just on the team, that contagiousness is still there. But just as a leader, I think so much of the contagiousness gets really amplified, because power dynamics tend to do that. Yeah, we model. I love that. It's a great suggestion. And before we close out, tell everyone listening where they can get in touch with you. Yes, you can get in touch with me at Erin, E-R-I-N-M, as in mindset, fully.com. It's funny because it's actually Erin Marie is my name and Erin Aaron Foley was taken. <laughs> And I've been saying Aaron M. Foley.com for I don't know how long. And I was on a podcast and he was like, M is in mindset. And I was like, how in the world did I not ever catch that? Like, yes, obviously. That's like 100% what I should be saying. So Aaron M as in mindset, AaronMFully.com. I have a free resource on there right now for people who are in a new job or a new role who are feeling insecure and want to really it walks you through, even if you're just having a fear of judgment, anything. I walk you through the process that I've been kind of talking about on this podcast of how to identify that fear, how to get curious about that fear, and how to turn it around. It's a free 
guide that I created and it's pretty extensive. So feel free to jump over there and grab that. And there's also information, there's blog stuff on there. There's information on my coaching on there, free consultation, all of that. Okay, perfect. And we'll link your website and that resource in the show notes perfect. so people can find it because I think people are going to want it. And to close out part one of our discussion, yeah. since we're we're going to have a two-parter, I'm not going to ask you the closing, closing questions, but a mini version of them. Okay. And so for this one, I just wanted to ask you to share something with someone who's listening, who maybe has heard this conversation and is like, this all makes sense. I want to work on myself, but maybe they're just experiencing a little bit of demoralization, a little bit of tiredness, a little bit of like, is this going to work for me? Is there anything that you could share with that person to maybe start to help them see the light at the end of the tunnel? They're asking, the fear is like, is mindset work going to work for me? Yeah. Like, am I actually going to change? Like this conversation felt great, but I feel really stuck. Um, What is there ahead for me? I mean, I think that if you can work with something really small for uh, as you start, right? Instead of thinking, it's so hard when we're thinking in the big space of like, I just want to feel like I'm good enough. And you wake up in the morning, you're like, how do I feel good enough today? It's like, it's so not tangible. And it's so big. And it's so overwhelming. And it can feel like, I don't know, like, how am I going to just like feel good enough all day? So I always would encourage people to think of something really tangible that you're struggling with. Think of a situation that you've been in recently that brought up something difficult for you. And start by asking yourself, if I believed something different in that situation, can I imagine how I would suffer less? And just if you can't get yourself to a belief yet, that's okay. But if you can just start to get curious about the situation, and even the step of noticing what you might be thinking during the encounter it puts you ahead of how most how much most people even think about things that happen. So if you had a fight with your coworker or a bad feedback from your boss and you're like feeling crappy, just start with that and be like, hmm, like what did I make that mean about myself? And if I believed something different, would I suffer less in that situation? And I think that's the way to sort of start to like, as you were saying, just like crack open that door and show the possibility to even even becoming aware that you made it mean something about yourself can often give you some space from what's happened. Thank you so much, Erin. You're welcome. Thank you for tuning in to my conversation with Erin. She's amazing, isn't she? I feel like she's in my brain. I just feel like her understanding is so, so deep and I so appreciate how she is this endless well of useful knowledge and I hope you felt the same. I'm going to link her information in the show notes and I have some good news, which is that this episode is part one of a two-part conversation. Last time I interviewed Erin, we went for two hours, and I knew that this time we were probably going to go for two hours again. So we actually planned it out that way and created two separate conversations. And next week's conversation is really diving even deeper into mindset and into the relationship between what we're thinking and our inner thoughts and all of those inner experiences that we're having about ourselves and what's around us and our behaviors and how we come off and how we show up at work. If you like mindset work, you will love this episode. She talks a lot about taking risks and our relationship with risk taking and why that is so, so, so important. We talk about career paths, being worried about one's career path, that it's not going right or that you're not on the right one or that you're behind in your career. I highly recommend listening. It is such a good one. And thank you so, so much to Erin. She's been wonderful. And I've had the pleasure of doing some coaching with her. And let me tell you, she is really good at what she does. I think that she was born to do this work. And I am so grateful that I connected with Erin, that I had her on the show. And I can't wait for you to hear part two. 
If you found value in this conversation, if you're enjoying the show, if you want me to know that you're enjoying the show, I would so appreciate a review in Apple Podcasts. They make me super happy. They're also very, very helpful. And to those of you who have left reviews, I see you and I thank you with all my heart. Thank you so, so much. And don't forget that there is a Facebook community that you can join. All you have to do is search The Art of Speaking Up on Facebook and I'll link it in the show notes. And Aaron is in that Facebook group and sometimes she pops in there and helps with someone's question. So it's another way to potentially get more Aaron Foley because I don't know about you, but there's no such thing as too much Aaron Foley. That's how I feel. Hope that wasn't creepy. Time for me to go. I'll catch you in the next episode. Have a wonderful, fabulous week and bye for now.